and we're really pleased today to be uh, co-presenting this with the Fellowship at Auschwitz for the Study of Professional Ethics. And Torsten Wagner is going to lead the discussion today um, from the big screen up there. Um, Torsten is a German historian born in Denmark. He's the Executive Director for Strategy and Academics for FASB. Um, based in New York City. Uh, prior to this role, he was an associate professor of modern European history at the Danish Institute for Study Abroad uh, at the University of Copenhagen. Mr. Wagner has also held positions as an educator at the Jewish Museum of Berlin and as a research fellow at the Danish Center for Holocaust and Genocide Studies in Copenhagen and at the Department of Scandinavian Studies, Humboldt Universität zu Berlin. I do not really speak German, just FYI. So apologies if I have mucked up any of those. Uh, he is the author of numerous publications in the fields of modern German and European Jewish history, anti-Semitism, Holocaust studies, cultures of memory, and Israeli history and society. And I'll turn over to, uh, to Thorsten for uh, uh, the introductions of the rest of our panel. Thank you, thank you so much. First of all, Matt, also a big thank you from my side for for this lecture that so much sets the, set the, stone, uh, the, the tone, but also set a very high standard in terms of how we can address these complicated issues with, um, with a lot of sensitivity and empathy. Thank you. Today is January 27th, uh, and uh, it's, of course, the reason why we're sitting here also to mark um, the liberation of Auschwitz, to mark and to um, remind ourselves um, of the Holocaust and its implications for our societies that we're in uh, today. So we are approximately 80 years out from um, the climax of the Nazi crimes, of the Nazi mass crimes, with the, the Holocaust, of course, at its uh, center. But uh, the way that I'd like to start us out is just to remind ourselves that for many decades, of course, commemorating the Holocaust and thinking about these crimes that uh, we've heard some of now presented by Matt uh, was not central to our memory uh, of the, the first uh, few decades of the 20th century and not even of World War II. So that is, of course, something that only has grown over the last few decades. Uh, Tony Judd famously said that for many Europeans, World War II was not about the Jews. Uh, and that's, of course, that's an important aspect to remind ourselves of. Now, we also all know that when it increasingly became central to be aware of the murder of European Jewry in the context of the Nazi crimes, it, over the years, of course, very often has been um, used, sometimes abused, for all kinds of purposes and agendas. And I think that's, of course, why what we heard today was so important, because one way of trying to avoid that is, of course, to be very specific and to think about the historical and the contemporary aspects in this very um, specific, uh, fact-oriented uh, way that, that Matt really has modeled for us today. So I think that's, that has been very important as well. In a different way, of course, this distance of about eight, eight decades is significant because scholars remind us that we are at this transition to what people call cultural memory. But right? many things that we remember for a long time was based on what people still could tell each other, right? How generations could convey some knowledge. But we're moving into a period where the next generation will only learn from it from education, from memorial museums, from mass culture. And that's, of course, a very important threshold that we are at uh, right now. This all leads me to with you to think about um, why this history uh, is relevant for us. Why do we consider this? And Matt, of course, gave some very important first um, thought provoking aspects of that uh, to us. What do we do with this history? Where's the relevance of it? One, of course, is for a long time has been uh, a reminder to listen to the victims, listen to the survivors, um, have those voices uh, be heard. But uh, I'm sure that when today um, the Auschwitz Museum and many other places in the world commemorate um, the Day of Liberation, the numbers of survivors is dwindling. So we're obviously also there in a very different uh, situation. And increasingly, the question is, how can we weave their testimony together with the questions about the perpetrators, with the questions about complicity? And this is, of course, something that um, 
Matt and his colleagues have decided also to focus on, and we are very grateful that we can be part of that conversation and that thinking also today um, as FASB as organization. A good friend, uh, Tim Snyder, that many of you will be familiar with, once wrote in a, a book of his about a decade ago that it's very easy to sanctify policies or identities by the deaths of victims, but um, it's less attractive, less popular, but probably morally more urgent to think about the actions of the perpetrators. Uh, because the moral danger, after all, for us is to become complicit, to become perpetrators. And I think that's a very um, serious and important uh, warning and frames us our conversation. So what we want to do together today with uh, for people that I'm going to introduce to you, to you in a moment um, is to think about what happens in terms of that transformation of moral standards and norms that German society underwent in the course of the 30s, where suddenly things become acceptable, Matt touched on that as well, and professionals, leaders in different parts of society, become key players in that transformation of German society, a very rapid uh, transformation that at the same time went on so fast that very often uh, the members of German society and also its leaders, its elites, barely were aware of that they found themselves in a different uh, and new moral um, setting. Um, Henry Friedlander, uh, who is a famous scholar, who is, of course also has dealt with some of the topics that we uh, discussed today, once made the point uh, about um, that there was no job listing uh, for experienced mass murderers in Nazi Germany. Uh, but uh, as Raoul Hilberg then also uh, had elaborated already years before, the crimes of Nazi Germany actually were committed by the existing personnel, by the existing institutions, uh, who almost all of them had a functional role in, in the course of the Holocaust. That means here a genocide, a mass crime in its different aspects, uh, was committed by a fairly representative cross-section of German society. And that, of course, leads me to a little bit also to the structure and the framework of our conversa conversation today, but also what uh, what FASB tries to do, FASB is an organization that has been around for a little bit more than a decade and has tried to, among other things, encourage young professionals by taking them to the sites where professionals became complicit to encourage them to think about their own ethical responsibility against the backdrop of this history. And uh, we will have some of the people that I'm welcoming here on the panel will have some FASB experience. Um, and uh, let me first just uh, start to introduce all the four of you. And then my plan is to perhaps ask the first opening question one by one and tell um, the audience a little bit more about who we have here. So um, on the panel with me uh, is Tessa Chelouche, who is uh, MD and at the Faculty of Medicine at the Technical Institute uh, in uh, Haifa, Israel, we have Mark Lukashevitz, who is the Dean of the Lawrence Herbert School of Communication at Hofstra. Um, we have Don Smith sitting next to Matt uh, here in Colorado, uh, JD Professor of Practice at the Sturm College of Law at the University of Denver, uh, and eventually Re Reverend Matt Stone, the Rector of Calvary Episcopal Church. I'll go more into detail of your biographies in a moment, but what we would like to start with uh, is as an opening question to ask you all to think with us about in what ways there were particular aspects where your profession was com complicit in the crimes of Nazi Germany um, in a distinct and specific way, something that uh, seems to be perhaps even unique to your profession or to your area that you're in and uh, share that, point that out with us. So that's what we're going to start with. And in that context, perhaps we can start with you, Tessa. Um, Tessa Shalush, as I said already, is a doctor from Israel. She's a family physician, actually, for the past 18 years and continuing in the present. She has taught an undergrad course on medicine at the Holocaust at the Technical Faculty of Medicine in Haifa in Israel. She's the co-editor of the Casebook on Bioethics and the Holocaust, and is the co-chair of the Department of Bioethics and the Holocaust of the International Chair of Bioethics. 
She's currently a member of the Lancet Commission on Medicine and the Holocaust, Historical Evidence, Implications for Today, Teaching for Tomorrow. Tessa, can I ask you to address that aspect of the uh, perhaps giving as an example of a specific area of being involved with the crimes of the Holocaust for medicine in continuation of what we've heard already earlier, of course. Hi. Yes, of course, Thorsten. Thank you. Thank you for having the honor and the privilege of participating in this panel tonight on the International Holocaust Remembrance Day. Uh, for me as a physician, medicine, uh, this history has a specific um, aspect. I think from all, for all professions, um, as we sit here tonight, that's the purpose of the, of the discussion. We have a very common, um, there are many common aspects uh, to this history. But as a physician and for other physicians and medical students especially, there are certain aspects to this history that are um, specific to medicine. And I would start saying what would we probably be relevant to all the professions was that, of course, this was not a natural, the Holocaust was not a natural disaster. It was a man-made uh, event. Human beings, intelligent human beings, educated human beings, physicians, doctors, engineers, lawyers, judges, and many others came together in specific and special circumstances to create the perfect storm to perpetrate these horrors. Most of them were not crazy or sadists that we would like to think. It would actually make it more comfortable to address this history if they, if they were. And the majority knew that they were doing something wrong, and yet they still did it. And I think that's a kind of a multi-professional aspect. Less known are the contribute on the contrib is the contribute contribution of the ordinary people, the ordinary uh, civilians in society. We, when we talk about the Holocaust and we watch um, material about the Holocaust, we often see perpetrators, the big ones, Himmler and Hitler and Eichmann and Heydrich. But I think what's really important is to learn from this history of the ordinary people um, among, among societies, the lawyers, the teachers, the civil servants, um, and, and of course, and all, uh, throughout Germany. Put simply, without these ordinary people, the Holocaust could not have happened. And that's probably something that's common to all professions. But for medicine, there are certain specific aspects. First of all, our profession is the profession that we are sworn to heal and to help and to care, not always to cure, but to care. And I think this was, of course, the most, it's the most extreme example, but it's the most extensively documented example of medical, as a medicine, as a profession, involvement in uh, inhuman medical atrocities. And all this was done in the name of medicine and in the name of science, of course, for the betterment of the state. Medicine was immensely involved in the programs that led up to the Holocaust. It was not corrupted. The, the profession as a profession was not corrupted by the Nazis. They were actively involved, willingly involved uh, in programs that were commenced even before laws were passed to actually justify and rationalize what they were doing. The whole ethics of our profession was changed. Um, they did not ignore ethics or abandon ethics, quite the opposite. They had a very, very clear medical ethic in place. And one of the things I think that is specific to medicine, and I'm not sure that it does exist in other professions, is that they had a very, very strict ethical, medical ethical code in place at the time, specially modified and changed to suit the Nazi ideals especially taught. They had a compulsory ethical course at every medical school, which I'm not sure we can say the same for other university professionals, where students had to learn the new ethic of the profession. And they did indeed, indeed learn, and they did indeed, of course, become many of them perpetrators because they had learned. But this was new, this was what expected of them, and this was kind of um, what they were, this was the, what was expected as a doctor in Nazi Germany, which I think this is pretty unique to medicine. 
the kind of the whole ethics, the whole professionalism, what was right and what was wrong was changed. They were taught differently, they began to believe differently, and unfortunately, they indeed did, um, did behave differently. And as I said, this took place long before there were even laws in place. The medical profession believed that their duty was first and foremost to the state and not to their individual patient, which is the basic tenant of medicine. Always has been, and it always will be, and it always should be, but not in Nazi Germany. They managed to change the profession and make people uh, in the field believe that their duty was first to the state. And I think that those are pretty unique things to medicine uh, of this history. Another maybe unique, more special thing for medicine is that, as Matt already had mentioned, all our ethical laws, regulations, um, um, codes today, basically stem and are born out of this history. Uh, that's not a, it's not very often taught, but it is uh, a historical fact that the, our medical world realized that we needed codes in place. It wasn't enough, just Hippocrates. Uh, and so the whole world, the whole, get, re regained our medical codes from this history. Um, that are, of course, relevant to today. Um, another, maybe another example of, of medical history, I want to mention this today because it is Holocaust Memorial Day, is that very, very, um, on the other side, very good examples of resilience and resistance can be learned from stories of uh, Holocaust survivors and, uh, and other people who survived the war who did manage to resist and who did manage to remain true to their own uh, moral code in medicine. Not many, and um, unfortunately, most of the uh, Jewish medical professionals, of course, did not survive. But that is another story, and that is another side to the story that on a day like this, I think we have to remember to, to commemorate that there is another side of people who were courageous enough to to resist, to stand by their own ethical codes, of course, under extremely, very, extremely difficult circumstances. So I would say those are the few aspects that maybe are pertinent to the medical profession. Thank you. Thank you, Tessa. So just to repeat that and where we want to go with this is, of course, that we have a hope that by discussing professional complicity in the Holocaust, that we hope eventually with these first different angles that uh, the panel presents, that we eventually can get to a reflection and a, and a conversation, what the professions of today can learn from each other. And that's where we will go eventually. But let me introduce the next um, contributor on the panel, Mark Lukashevitz, who is a veteran producer and a journalist and media executive. He's the Dean of um, the School of Communication at Hofstra that I already mentioned and serves also, I'm proud to say, as the journalism faculty of the fellowships at Auschwitz for the Study of Professional Ethics, FASB. Prior to this, he was the Senior Vice President of Specials at NBC News, where he planned and supervised coverage of major news events, such as the death of Osama bin Laden, the visit of Pope Francis to the US, and presidential elections and debates. Mr. Lukashevitz also spent 11 years at ABC News, where he was an executive producer of Good Morning America, senior producer of World News Tonight with Peter Jennings, and senior producer of Primetime Live with Diane Sawyer and Sam Donaldson. His work has been recognized with 10 Emmy Awards, two Peabody Awards, and the Grand Prize of the Robert F. Kennedy um, Journalism Awards, among many others. Mark, thank you for joining us. Could you try to get us started with some reflections about what the complicity of journalists look like, and if there's something that stands out as particular or specific? Perhaps you shouldn't use the unique term too much, but um, what does it do? And you should unmute, by the way. Thank you. I was actually thinking of that as you were posing the question. Um, so there are some unique things, I think, about journalism in this era and, and the complicity that we have to uh, be aware of and, and think about. Um, first of all, unlike a seminary, unlike medicine, unlike law, journalism is not a licensed profession. Um, pretty much anywhere around the world then and now can call themselves a journalist. 
um, training, formal training in the profession of journalism is, is um, by no means an aspect of the majority of people practicing the craft or the trade. And certainly in the era of the Nazis, um, the journalism education didn't really exist as such. People were writers, they were authors, they were often political activists. So that, that's one unique aspect. Um, the second thing I, say, I would say that's unique here in terms of the context of, of Germany and the Holocaust is uh, journalists, I think, had a unique ability and moral responsibility to tell the story of what was going on. Uh, journalists were uniquely positioned to let German society know and let the world know um, what was happening and to investigate what was happening in the Eastern territories as the Holocaust uh, unfolded. So now let's split up what happened. Well, first of all, we have the German press. Uh, the German press at the time was largely politically aligned. Um, there were something like, Torsten, you'll correct me if I'm wrong, I think 4,700, 4,800 newspapers uh, around Germany, an enormous number of newspapers, which was the main thing. Radio was still in its infancy. Um, they were largely politically aligned, some religiously aligned. Um, so people writing in newspapers, while many of them were journalists looking to report facts, they were doing it to some greater or lesser extent with a political agenda in mind, looking to advance facts that advance their political agenda. Um, now, what happened in Germany uh, with the rise of the Nazis and ultimately when Hitler became chancellor, chancellor was very quickly, uh, press became an organ of the state. Um, a press council was, was created uh, loyalty to the regime and to propagating the message of the regime became a sine qua non of practice of journalism. Journalists who didn't go along with that, publications that didn't go along with that, ceased to exist in the profession. Um, and very rapidly, the number of new newspapers declined. The Nazi Party's own newspaper became the dominant newspaper of the country. I think it had a circulation well over a million by its peak in 1941 or so. Um, and the, the journalism was controlled. So professional journalists made a number of choices. Some fled, left the country, uh, and either started doing something else or wrote uh, under pseudonyms, tried to continue uh, reporting from outside the boundaries of the country. Some went into one form or other of internal exile making their living some other way. Some journalists who had written about politics suddenly became theater reviewers uh, because they chose to, I can still make a living, but I won't really be actively participating. That's sort of the rationalization. Um, but many, many thousands of them signed on for the project and became mouthpieces, authors, writers uh, of the regime's propaganda tools um, Throughout, throughout the rest of the period. So um, certainly not um, a moment in which uh, journalism inside Germany was covered in glory. But let's be honest that it was a totalitarian, totalitarian state uh, and each of these individuals faced real consequences uh, for their actions. What's equally important is what the foreign press did. And here too, unfortunately, uh, it must be said we have failure. Um, it's only recently, as Torsten pointed out to me, um, it's only really quite recently in some cases that large institutions uh, of the American media have done self-examination of that period and done deep research. And two things come to mind. So first of all, the Associated Press, uh, perhaps the biggest single uh, worldwide news organization at the time, the Associated Press uh, made a bargain with the devil. They signed a deal with the Nazi regime. Uh, their photo service, which was an instrumental part of their business at the time, and um, was, was the beginning of a dawn where images were an important part of news gathering. You know, going back to the 20s, it was print, but suddenly news photography was becoming uh, a very important aspect of business and of publication. Uh, they made a deal with the Nazis to trade images and to allow the Nazi regime to write the captions on photographs that were disseminated by the Associated Press. 
So the world saw images that were approved by the Nazis, sometimes that were captured by the Nazis, and the editorial content of which was written by the Nazis. That was not disclosed uh, until recently. Um, the other big institution worth examining is the New York Times. And the New York Times had a very uh, dominant presence in the United States then as they do now. Uh, they had a big uh, operation in Germany run by a bureau chief who was American born, but of German extraction and, and lived much of his life in Germany, um, who soft peddled the, the regime's uh, most extreme positions introduced a lot of skepticism into the New York Times' reporting of events. Um, and some data that was gathered again quite recently within this century, um, if you look at the entire scope of the New York Times reporting during uh, the entire Nazi period, the Holocaust appeared 26 times on the front page of the New York Times during the entire sweep of history. Um, and Torsten, if you'll, if you'll forgive me, I, I just, I came across something today that I want to read because I think it's, it sort of exemplifies the sort of thing that reporters and publications did to retain access to the Nazis, to be able to continue in business. Let me read you something from the lead of the New York Times, uh, reporting on a speech that Hitler gave. This is a direct quote from the article. A peaceful, prosperous Europe was envisaged today by Chancellor Hitler in a speech before the Reichstag. The tenor of the speech was self-assertive, yet free of aggressive emphasis, and it ended in a note that left full scope for diplomatic action or mediation. If the tone of the speech can be accepted as a gauge, Herr Hitler sincerely desires a peaceful solution of the conflict with Britain and France. That was published by the New York Times five weeks after World War II began. Poland was already finished. That was what the American public was getting from the premier institution in the United States, supervised by a bureau chief who had his eye on keeping things going in Germany. So um, anyway, just, just some examples, but I, but I think the uniqueness has to do with the unique responsibility, it seems to me, to tell the world what's going on in any given situation. And um, it was not a shining moment for the press. Thank you, Mark. That was also a very powerful example you shared with us there. Let me introduce our third panelist, um, Don Smith, who is a professor of the practice of law at the University of Denver Sturm College of Law. He has a Bachelor of Science degree from the University of Kansas, a JD from the Washburn University School of Law, and a Master's in European Union Law uh, from the University of Leicester uh, Faculty of Law. Since 2020, he has co-taught a course titled Holocaust Seminar for Denver University Law students. The course explores the enthusiastic support the legal German legal system provided to the Nazi regime and considers how the US race law system provided quote unquote inspiration for the Nazi race laws. Don, would you also open up your perspective, please, for, in terms of the legal professionals? Yeah, th thank you, Thorsten. Um, <clears throat> the legal profession was involved in very central ways in the Nazi regime. Uh, but we need to go back to the 1st of January of 1933, when the German Judges Association, which was not yet part of the Nazi uh, regime, <clears throat> said they, they feared what might come in 1933. And they made allusions to Adolf Hitler in particular, saying he might defy rule of law which up until that point had been something that the German legal profession prided itself on. Uh, not dissimilar to what Matt told us uh, a few minutes ago, the German legal profession was a very highly respected group. And in comparison to the United States legal profession in many people's eyes was as sophisticated or more sophisticated than the American legal system. The end of January 1933, Hitler becomes chancellor. 
And within a few weeks, there's the Reichstag fire decree, of course, uh, written, uh, not if entirely, there were certainly lawyers who worked on that short piece of uh, law. A few weeks later, the Enabling Act. Again, uh, lawyers worked on that, and uh, we can only ask ourselves as a profession, uh, why did these people who wrote those laws, what did they think they were doing? Now, again, to refer back to something that Matt said about the, the medical profession, I've heard people say that the Nazi regime and the Holocaust could have never happened without the complicity and the enthusiastic support of the legal profession. I say that because obviously lawyers were involved in the uh, Reichstag fire decree, the Enabling Act, and later the Nazi racial laws. But interestingly enough, uh, there was an opportunity in March of 1933 to bring in front of the German Supreme Court what the Nazis were doing and to have the German Supreme Court rule on whether these measures were in conflict with the Weimar Republic Constitution, because they were. And the German Supreme Court ruled that no, this could go ahead. It was only gonna go ahead for a short time, the Enabling Act, the Reichstag Fire Decree, because things would return to normal fairly shortly. And from then on, April, May of 1933, the judiciary became worked hand in glove with the Nazi regime. Um, that is trouble from a professional standpoint. Another example, uh, and now I'm, I'm moving to the beginning of the war in 19, well, actually the beginning of Operation Barbarossa in 1941. Many of the officers who led the Einsatzgruppen SS brigades uh, that went into these conquered territories and slaughtered people, the Holocaust uh, by bullets, I think some cause, call it, were lawyers. And the reason the SS had these people as officers was that lawyers, generally speaking, are good speakers, they're articulate, and people re respect them. Uh, the society holds them in a certain a uh, high level of, um, of acceptance, I guess. Um, that was, this was shocking. And incidentally, what I'm telling you today, I never learned in law school and I never heard any of this before I began teaching the course in 2020. So it, it's hardly as if, uh, oh, all law schools are teaching this. Final example I could give is uh, January 20th, 1942, and 15 high-ranking uh, Nazi officials and government officials uh, convene at Wannsee outside of Berlin. This was the meeting that is largely known as putting into place the mechanics for the final solution. There were 15 high-ranking people there. Nine of the 15 were either lawyers, trained in the law, or judges. Nine of the 15. It seems incredible. So at, at every step along the way, uh, the Nazis and the legal professions, which once the Nazis took power, they set up a Nazi lawyers group and a Nazi judges association and all other bar associations were eliminated. But it is, and we've talked about this and I've talked to my class about it. It is incredible that, uh, oh, one final thing I, I should mention with respect to the Nazi racial laws. And again, Matt made reference to this. They were inspired by uh, what was going on in the United States. In 1934, a young Nazi lawyer came to the University of Arkansas Law School, and he spent a semester there. And he, what he did was he was there to find out, catalog, 
the American racial laws, particularly with respect to Native Americans and African Americans. And he subsequently wrote a law journal article that was published in one of the most prestigious American law reviews in 1934, that in essence was a blueprint for what the Nazis ended up doing uh, with their racial laws. So how was it that American laws, and to some extent the American uh, judicial system, became inspirational for the Nazis? This is a chapter of the history of the profession that I'm a part of that is never talked about. And um, that is troubling. Anyway, thank you. Thank you, Don. Um, finally, last but not least, uh, Matt Stone. Um, like to also quickly introduce you and then ask you to um, share your thoughts with us. Matt was a 2017 seminary fellow. FASB operates in six different disciplines. Uh, four of them we have uh, also are covering today here. Um, and uh, you were a fellow in 2017, as I said. Uh, you now serve as the rector of Calvary Episcopal Church in Bastrop, Texas, southeast of Austin. Uh, Father Matt helped develop uh, Brazos Valley Common Good to build relationships across racial differences and is working to make Calvary a place for marginalized communities, LGBTQI, neurodivergent immigrants and other groups to call a home. Matt enjoys spending time with his wife of 17 years, Heather, uh, and the three-year-old son, Henry, traveling, watching great stories on the small screen and rooting for the Los Angeles Dodgers. Now, for me, I have no idea what these teams are, but uh, thank you for sharing. <laughs> Matt, where is, where's the specificity of um, the role of clergy and religious leaders in this context, please? Sure. Thank you so much, Thorsten. And it's an honor to be uh, with, uh, with all of you today uh, as we remember together. Um, similar to how the other Matt um, uh, started his journey, we, we have to go back a bit. Um, and uh, just trace the roots of anti-Semitic theology um, that has existed, you know, since early on in the Christian tradition, unfortunately, really starting with the Gospel of John, um, where, uh, you know, the Jews uh, are referred to in really negative ways uh, repeatedly, uh, and um, uh, the writer of the Gospel of John uh, really lays the blame for the crucifixion of Jesus at the Jews' feet. Uh, and then over time, those seeds are are, are sown in different ways. Uh, Martin Luther, of course, uh, the famous uh, German leader of the Reformation, um, wrote um, late in life with uh, just great uh, anti-Semitic language uh, that the um, Nazis would go back and use since uh, Luther was really a, a folk hero in Germany. Uh, and... Um, you know, in the church's history, uh, on Good Friday, for example, that is when the church historically has read uh, the Gospel of John's um, passion narrative about the death of Christ. And Jewish uh, folks often, uh, you know, I'm not sure if this, I, I know this happened in the United States, I'm not sure if it was happening in Europe, but had the sense that they really needed to stay off the streets on Good Friday because uh, the Christians would leave after hearing uh, John's uh, very anti-Semitic presentation of of Good Friday, and um, and uh, often per perpetrate violence against uh, any Jewish folks that they ran into. Uh, finally, there's uh, uh, developed a sense that you know in the Christian Church uh, we have uh, the Hebrew Scriptures, you know, uh, often called the Old Testament, and then the New Testament, which even that language suggests uh, a bit of replacement. Um, and so the theological term that we've used for that is supersession, is in the idea that the church superseded um, the, the people of Israel as God's chosen people. The people of Israel, in rejecting Jesus, um, lost access to the covenant. They lost their relationship with, um, with their God, and that the church was then given all of the rights and responsibilities that came with that. So we have this history, 1900 years of, of anti-Semitic theology. And we also have the church as an institution uh, dealing with, over time, 
a real difficulty uh, in, in our relationship with organized power and, and the state, right? So the early church was persecuted, meaning in catacombs, and those who were caught, you know, were often thrown in the Colosseum. Uh, but just a short 800 years later, uh, Pope Leo III was laying his hands on Charlemagne and consecrating him uh, the uh, first Holy Roman Emperor. And so we went from being a persecuted church at odds with the state to the vehicle of um, authorizing and consecrating a political power. And so we really see this start to play out um, in, in bold strokes and colors in uh, the rise of the Third Reich. Church leaders in Germany, their primary concern was what the Nazis could and would do to the institution of the church. Um, there was some concerns about their use of violence, um, but really, aside from some heroic outliers, there was no established concern for the Jewish people. Um, the church itself was really caught in uh, caught up in anti-Semitism, but there was a deep concern uh, about what church leaders at every level, uh, from uh, archbishops all the way down to the parish priests needed to do in order to protect the institution of the church in this time of great kind of uncertainty um, politically. And so we see uh, the Catholic Church signed an agreement with the Nazis uh, right out of the gate in 1933 that gave the Catholic Church rights to continue their work in exchange for clergy members not being involved in political parties and political activities. Uh, and so the, uh, the Catholic Church in that case just kind of taking a vow of silence. Um, of course, there was the strong Protestant German church uh, and Christians there, many of whom envisioned the rise of the Nazis as an opportunity to finish the Reformation and build one right church. And as I was listening to Matt share, it kind of reminded me of almost a kind of spiritual eugenics, uh, right? If the church could partner and coalesce around the Nazi party, we could create the, the one right perfect church, Um and then there was the Confessing Church, uh, which uh, tends to have become, in in popular circles, a bit of a rehabilitation story. You know, if you get too uncomfortable with this and what the church did, um, just look at the Confessing Church, and, and that gives us hope. And while the members of the Confessing Church and their leaders do oppose the Nazi program, the reason is not to protect or support the Jewish people, uh, our siblings. Um, there was really more of an emphasis about the state's role uh, you know, with the church and staying out of the church's business so the church could be the church. Uh, so it's very, very complicated and um, and, and not at all, uh, not at all positive. Um, it, it, when I was a FASB fellow uh, during, during uh, one of our seminars, someone said it, it was less of an issue of Christianity being infected or co-opted by Nazism and more an issue of how Christian anti-Semitism over 1900 years became fuel for Nazism. And so it's important in the church that we not let everybody off the hook, um, but realize what the church really brought. Now in the United States and in, in the church here, some pastors after Kristallnacht invited Jewish rabbis to share from their pulpit, which would have likely been the first time that kind of partnership would have been envisioned and, and, and possible. But churches, um, by and large, tended not to say much. They focused a bit on refugees, but especially Christian refugees, again, not, not providing aid to Jewish refugees that were fleeing Europe. Uh, and anti-Semitism continued to have its expression here. Um, there was a leading Christian anti-Semite leader, far, uh, Father Charles Coughlin, a, a Catholic priest, who had a national radio program and following Kristallnacht said that Jewish persecution only followed after Christians first were persecuted. Um, and so, um, so we really get a sense of, of what was happening, um, both here in the States and in, in Europe. Um, essentially the calculus that the, that the Nazis made was that they could easily buy the church's silence in order to kind of leave the church alone uh, somewhat. And, um, and that priests and, and bishops were glad to take that deal. I think some of the things that are, are unique in, in terms of the church's expression in response to the Holocaust, is you know churches then and now are not not a fee for service, right? I mean, you you go to a lawyer, you go to a doctor, you you pay, and there's some some element of, of choice. But the church is a living community, right? So there was a voluntary affiliation uh, happening, and um, 
and and which I think maybe may may have fueled great fear uh, about what the Nazis could do um, to the institution of the church. However, the church now, I mean, I'm I I can only speak you know to my contemporary uh, setting is still can be at its best a place to be in relationship across differences and invite people to see things and, and see people in different ways. Um, and so that I think there is real opportunity as we think about the lessons we can learn for how we um, as professionals live today. The church does have a unique opportunity, uh, as all faith communities do, to, to bring different people together. And finally, and what really makes uh, causes great sorrow in my heart is the church um, you know, uh, our, our, our medical professionals have the Hippocratic Oath. You know, in the church, we have, um, you know, we have Genesis 1, 26 and 27, what we call the Imago Dei, the idea that the image of God is placed deep within every human being. And, um, and that should lead to an emphasis on seeing God in every person and, uh, and standing up for those who are othered, um, when their image of God is, is being ignored. Um, and so it's so deeply tragic that that was so easily discarded in the name of self-preservation of an institution. Thank you, Matt. And you already did something that I'd like us to do a little bit more now broader, and that's, of course, to think about the implications for this for, um, for a time after 1945, right? Where, where do we stand today with this? Um, but just to start on... Um, where we just left in terms of the role of clergy, um, uh, Manfred Geilos once wrote about Protestantism that uh, Nazism and the Holocaust was a moral catastrophe of Protestantism in the moment of truth. Obviously, that's in different ways also true for Catholicism. That's not the point here. Uh, and I'd like to broaden that and say that, of course, brings me to think about what we've heard over the last hour uh, almost is, of course, how we really can see a failure of leaders, the failure of the elites, the failure of the professionals, almost across the board, with some exceptions, of course. What I was hoping we will in a moment also start to take questions, and I still would encourage uh, everybody who is following us to um, add some questions in the Q&A so that we can uh, include the audience here. But what I would hope is also that we can get a little bit of a dialogue between all of you as panelists, and perhaps even also comment on each other if there's something that stands out. Um, but just to get us started somewhere, the, the only historical aspect that I will kind of um, mention here is I wonder whether thinking about your areas uh, professionally, whether looking at the reasons why so many of the leaders um, in your profession, I know that this is a term that only works so far for, for some of you, um, were attracted to Nazism. Um, to what degree that seemed to have to do with specific cultural ideological reasons or whether you also very often see other aspects work with that matt stone mentioned the 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 need to protect the institution uh mark lukashevitz you mentioned certain aspects about staying in business i wonder whether we can have a little bit of reflection of that but again i don't want to nail us down in this kind of historical discussion i think that our purpose is really also to think about Perhaps as a second step beyond the historical, um, what what is the significance of this for today uh, in these different areas and in the responsibility of professionals for our contemporary societies and perhaps even also to think about strategies? How should this affect our um, the way that uh, these different professional institutions or other organizational structures should be defined, uh, consequences for education, etc.? But perhaps I can open that, it up for the panel to uh either ask each other questions or at least to address that question about the relationship between the more specific cultural ideological motives and some other motives somebody who wants to volunteer to start uh, okay i'll go the implications for today for medicine um i think every slide that matt um pulled up in his talk can be um, thought of can be um, listed out kind of to to the implications for our profession today uh, you know there are so many aspects of medicine that were involved um, 
in in Nazi medicine, which is unbelievable. It was only a 12 year phenomenon. We are all we sometimes forget it, but it was only 12 years and that yet they managed to do so much, so much bad. And I think every um, aspect of whether it be relation of power, um, a, a authority, relation of a profession to the to the person that you are serving, in our case, the patient, in a journalist's case, the, um, you know, the getting the proper word out in all of our cases. Who, who do we owe our loyalty to? Who do we think of first? Our relationship, as I said, to the state. Um, uh, there is not a single ethical issue today, or almost not, that we can't take back to, the part, to this past, this specific past, and learn from. Uh, once again, the point is not to give the answers, of course, especially in ethics and bioethics and professional ethics. The point is to ask the questions, not to give the answers. And that I think that's one of the points that, as, a, as a teacher for students or for young professionals, we want them to um, basically to be able to ask to, of themselves and of their, of their peers the question so that they can, can take moral responsibility for their professional identity, basically. And I think that's common to all the professions. That we want, we want young people who, who can take this, not just as a history lesson, and to realize that, as I said, each, each topic that we talk about, especially in, in relation to medicine, but everything that we've mentioned to, tonight, here, today, for me it's night, um, is still relative today. There is so much, I think, that all professions, all human beings can learn from our history and should learn from our history. And even though this is a very extreme example, in its extremity, it has so much to teach us. And I think that's the um, implications. The, uh, another, uh, another reason to use this history is that also in today's world, the, you know, the Nazi analogy is thrown up so often in the press, in, in the general press, in the medical press, in, in uh, the, the social media. It's so easy to say today, anything, you know, you want to shut down a discussion or you want to brand somebody with a kind of label, you, you Nazi an analogy comes up and it's so um, important that we educate the future generations, um, you know, what, it, what, what Nazism really was and, and, and how it did affect, as we can see, and as we know, and as we are learning to in this meeting, Every single one of us, all the professions, um, as I said, all the ordinary people. Um, I think that these implications, that's, that's, the, that's the real reason to teach this history, is to take the students and think about what it means for them. And as FASP is doing, and as we are trying to do as well in the medical profession, it's not easy. Um, but, um, but I think that's what our goal, that's what we should be doing. Thank you. Mark, you unmuted. Is that a sign? Yeah, no, I, I, I just wanted to pick up on that. I think, um, you know, and you know this, uh, Torsten, when in, in the journalism track in FASB, it, it isn't about trying to teach uh, our young professionals what's right and what's wrong. It's, it's trying to make sure they recognize decisions that are ethical decisions, large ones and small ones. And in our profession, you know, I, I, I don't know whether this is more or less than the other professions, but journalism is almost in every aspect a set of compromises. Um, you know, I'll just point out, if you are uh, operating in Russia today as a Western journalist, you have to find a way to report on that war that doesn't use the word war. Because to use the word war is breaking the law. And you will not be able to operate freely. Uh, if you are a journalist trying to cover anything going on in China, by definition, you are doing that with the approval of the Chinese government. And so there are compromises there. Every time I talk to a source, I might be making a decision about whether to grant that source anonymity or not. Um, that is That can be an ethical choice. Giving someone the privilege of being able to say things without attribution is a privilege, is a power, is a, is a weapon that I'm handing over to somebody. So these are all potentially um, ethical landmines and, and it's very difficult to navigate. And I think part of the instructive piece about 
teaching what happened in this era is not to simply say, oh, this is like that. Look at how obvious that was. No, it's to say that tens of thousands of individuals made millions of individual decisions uh, that may have seemed small to them, or maybe they grew and got bigger over time, but it resulted in millions of people being part of a machine that did something that seems utterly unthinkable. Thank you. Matt? Yes, yeah, I think it, um, what it's making me think of is uh, one's, our definition of success, right? I think part of what motivated people in these professions was career advancement. And in the church, certainly it was just easier to go along, to get along, especially if you're in a denominational structure. And um, and so as, as I think about ethical issues today and how to approach them in a, a fairly conservative context, um, in in Texas, uh, there's there's this balance of how do you how do you invite people to into conversation, right? But also recognize that you might lose some folks. You might not have the biggest church in town, um, and that there's a different definition of success that makes that okay because you're using your voice, platform, and privilege um, to uh, to stand with those who are being marginalized and others and and othered. Matt, can I ask you a follow-up question and also weave that in with uh, a, a um, audience question here, perhaps? Uh, first, just read the audience, and then I'll give it a little bit of a, a, perhaps an extra spin from my side. The audience question uh, reads, uh, as neo-colonialist and neo-fascist ideologies become more prevalent in the United States, do you think that health professionals or other professional organizations and institutions are doing enough to combat this rise? And if not, what does active prevention of this rise look in your opinion? Now, that's what was not what you just addressed, but I think there are some structural uh, issues here that, that are uh, connected. Uh, and where I wanted to go with this is, of course, perhaps just to have you address a classic, but I think for this forum also very interesting. And that's, of course, the juxtaposition of your role and your um ethical decision between uh, the, your duties as the pastor versus your duties as the prophet uh, and what, what kind of a third position there might be. But what I mean with these categories is, of course, not only that you might lose some donors, members, etc., but that you could ethically also say that you let down somebody when you speak up against what you see as a problematic um, ethical, moral, political um, voice uh, in your congregation and you speak up against it prophetically. Um, but then a few days later, you need to be the counselor or you need to bury a relative of that person, et cetera. How do we deal with these kinds of tensions? Yeah, that's a, it's a good question. I would, I would say first to, to the audience question. Um, uh, no, I don't think we're doing enough. You know, I, it, it's been really difficult to watch the the church in the United States, uh, a, a portion of the church, be uh, kind of co-opted into Christian nationalism and the rise of Christian nationalism in our country. It's very frightening um, and needs to be addressed. Uh, in my own context, um, how, how I have approached that, and I've, I've learned a, a lot of ways not to do it, and hopefully I'm getting better at, at how to do it, is, you know, the power of relationship um with with people you know you can't just come into a to a context and and be a prophet if if you also intend to be the pastor right so there has to be relationship and creating space for for difference and for there to be encounter and so uh recently we had our our first uh transgender um person come come into worship and and they were warmly welcomed and um and some of our members who are who are of you know, an older generation, you know, one in particular came to me afterwards and said, you know, what, what kind of person was that? Um, which is not, not a helpful question, but it was their, it was their question. And, and I said, I'm, I'm not quite sure, but you know, um, he's here and let's welcome him and, and get to know him. And now those two people have become very good friends. And so that proximity, that encounter, I think is, is so important. I was saying the power of storytelling, which is one of the gifts of, of organizations like FASBE. It's one thing to study ethics in the safety of a, of a classroom. There's another thing to go to a place and encounter people uh, and the power of place and be transformed that makes it much more real. And so thinking about stories that we can share um, 
in in church context and in other contexts that that help remind us, as someone has already said, that we all face moments of decision, and it never feels big in the moment. It just feels like I have to make this decision so I can go home and go be with my family and have dinner. But that's where the work is right there. Thank you, Don. Uh, Thorsten. If if you don't mind, I'd just like to jump in after what Please. Matt said. Um, Something that has concerned me about the teaching of ethics in law schools is that the, the ethics that are being taught are things like don't have a relationship with your client, uh, don't commingle the client's funds with your funds, uh, that sort of thing. But it seems to me that what is missing, at least in the legal uh, arena, is discussions like the one we're having today, where some powerful person asks a lawyer to do something that lawyer knows is a lie, and that lawyer goes out and appears on Fox News and MSNBC and wherever else, and then goes and lies to the court, which is unethical, as well as lies to the public about things that the lawyer knows are not true. Now, I'm not equating the, you know, 2023 uh, lawyers with what happened in the Nazi regime, but it seems to me that uh, what the Nazis did very well is they, they made this sort of behavior normal. It just became part of German society. Oh, the law was this one day, and now the law is something else 24 hours later, and nobody asks any questions. And I also am concerned that uh, th this matter of empathy, which Matt raised, um, th what I hear at my law school, which is a fine law school, good professors, uh, they're professors who uh, think about these things, but they say, essentially, we don't have time to talk about this because this isn't on the bar examination. This is not going to help anybody pass the bar examination. And yet, I ask myself, what could be more important to tell, to over and over and over again, tell young lawyers, when you take that oath of admission, you're also going to take an oath to the United States Constitution and the state constitution where you are. In the Weimar Republic, lawyers took an oath to the Weimar Republic Constitution. And very shortly after Hitler came to power, that was changed and you took an oath to Adolf Hitler and the Nazi party. Now, again, I'm not saying that is happening today, but what is clear is there are people in the American legal profession, for reasons I'm not entirely sure about, who are willing to go out and say things that are misleading and are corrosive to our democracy. But the learning about that has to start in law school. Uh, and I, I wish there was more focus on that. Thank you. Um, yeah, I would, I would also say that I think- Yes, please. This whole, it's very, um, as Matt and I and our colleagues have had very long, meaningful discussions, how important it is to teach this material and how people don't understand how important it is to teach this material until they've heard it, many of them. Um, and I think it goes back to, once again, it's not maybe, it's not for an exam, it's not for the board exam, as, as Don said, uh, you know, you don't uh, you don't get anything really um, before before you learn. It seems to be that the first of all, the deans of the medical faculties. It's very hard to tell them that there's something to teach here. But I think I also I I really um, identify with the fact that it's not because it's not on the syllabus as a as a as a, a large point making uh, course, or it's not going to be part of the, as you said, the board exam, the license exam, that it makes it less important. But I think as Matt Stone said, um, one of the, re one of the um, tools that this history provides us with is the storytelling. And I think students 
in every profession, learn from what we call in, you know, case histories or case studies. And uh, I think this history has so much to offer uh, so that people, as Don said, people will realize that there is a reason to teach this for everyday uh, professional activity. It's not that we're not going to become, every doctor is going to become the next Mengele or every politician is going to become a Himmler. I mean, we, that's, as I said, those are the easy things to talk about. The difficult things and the relative things to talk about are how each of us in our professions on a daily basis will make, will think about what we are, will just think about what we are doing um, and realize that we can do and somebody might make us do something different. And we should be there, especially as all our professions are social. We have a social responsibility, not only a professional responsibility. Medicine, journalism, the church, of course, we have a social responsibility to our patients, peers, communities. And so I think telling the stories of this history, using case histories, using personal histories, is also a very powerful tool that it does provide. And that once people realize that they were human beings just like we are, we all have the same DNA. I mean, this whole talking course race here where we all know that we are almost 100% identical to each other all over the world and I come from I was grew up in apartheid South Africa so I know what I'm talking about when I say racism I, I was born and brought up in, in race in apartheid South Africa so if as once I said it's just the, if we can make people aware that this history can affect us on a daily basis not big decisions and major corporation um, events, just us as human beings, people, professionals working to, to try and, 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 as we said already, ask ourselves, are we doing the right thing or are we, um, um, as you said, uh, Matt, you have dilemmas in your practice. Of course, us as, as physicians, we have dilemmas on a daily basis, little ones, but important ones. And um, I think I totally identify, of course, with the importance of communication nothing nothing beats communication between a pastor and his uh, congregation between a physician and his patients a journalist and and his readers i mean obviously communication is really is what we need uh, i can really identify with what you're saying from the different professions to what we um often discuss when when we are talking about medicine and, and the holocaust and it's really interesting to hear uh, how we Kind of, it's the, it's the same story that there is to be told. For today, I mean, you know, the, the implications are very similar. So I have <laughs> one or two things that I'd like to touch on before we will enter into our final round in a few minutes. But uh, Matt Vinya, if there are questions where you are sitting in the room, perhaps you should give, uh, are there anybody, I can't see if somebody has raised hands, anything, you're looking around. I cannot hear you, but uh, it seems as if there is a question. I will, I will uh, go. Uh, my name is Carl Barnes. I'm a physician here in Denver. And um, the topic I'm going to have, I, I would like to hear both from ethicists and uh, Reverend Stone from a clergy perspective, maybe even a legal. It's the present day decrease or discrepancy in the number of live births of children with Down syndrome in countries of Europe uh, relative to the United States. And just to give a few little quotes or numbers, in Europe, the uh, incidence has decreased by 54%, and this is uh, due to prenatal uh, testing. The United States is down by 33%, but in countries in Iceland in 2017, it was at or near zero. And in Denmark, uh, and again, I'm reading from the Atlantic, so this is not the most prestigious medical journal, but um, in 2019, there were 18 uh, live births of Down syndrome, whereas there's 6,000 per year in the United States. So kind of those tripwire uh, questions that... Uh, Dr. Winia mentions is that in some respect, this is nothing like the Holocaust, but 
in what ways might there be similarities, particularly how we view um, the value of those who are most vulnerable in society and how that reflects on us. And perhaps, you know, here in the United States, so much of it is religion and politics. So our friends in Europe, I was wondering, um, what is this as far as an ethical debate? Um, it's probably different politics and uh, religious aspect in the United States, but is this, how is this um, addressed in uh, Denmark and the other? I assume that the question is connected with issues of prenatal diagnostics. Uh, is, are there some other panelists who would like to take a shot at it? Matt, I kind of want to hear Matt Stone's um, thought. Okay, about, all right. Uh, I'll, I can I'll, frame it just by saying, you know, obviously these are not on the basis, the, these changes are not occurring because the state decided to implement a policy of let's eliminate births of children with Down syndrome. They're individual decisions by individual families about whether to continue a pregnancy once they learn that the child is going to have Down syndrome. And that seems like a pretty fundamental difference. And yet, if the outcome is the same, it does raise these questions of, is this still eugenics? Um, it's not eugenics as state policy, it's eugenics arising out of social norms mm -hmm. and, um, you know, and systems of care and support that do or do not exist to take care of a child born with Down syndrome and so on. I think, so, the, I think I let's, let's- The comment that the, um, one of the things that's come is that the, where the reductions are greatest are in societies where the ability to care for- A good social, disabled, social safety. Are, the social structure are like, if you had a child with Down syndrome, you would much rather have them raised in Denmark than you would in the United States. And yet there's kind of that yeah. difference. So that cultural, religious, uh, so it's very different than obviously the issues of the Holocaust, but um, it's it seems to be striking between there and particularly in the countries where the Holocaust occurred that there's that kind of drastic change. Matt Stone? Yes, yeah, so I, you know, um, as, as I mentioned earlier, you're thinking about the Imago Dei and the image of God in each person, right? I don't, I'm not going to pretend to diagnose uh, what's happening in Denmark and their, their own spirituality, but I know even in our, in our country, that is, that is a significant issue. And also given, you know, recent events around, you know, uh, what's happened with Roe versus Wade, I want to be very careful as a, as a white man, not to be encouraging, um, you know, uh, pregnant families to, <laughs> You just need to, the, the the ethical decision is to keep, you know, a baby that uh, is going to have, this is going to be neurodivergent, right? Um, so it's kind of a way to model the storytelling. Um, we have a, a family in our congregation and uh, they have uh, uh, two children, the youngest of whom is, is neurodivergent, not Downs. Um, but uh, it's been really powerful to watch that family. This has become an invitation for them that has really widened their life experience and um, helped them find uh, a deeper community of other neurodivergent families. And they, along with some of our other families um, with neuro neurodivergent children are actively working to develop a, a gathering, a worship gathering that's really done with, um, with neurodivergent folks and folks just on the margins in mind. Because you know, an hour long service with three readings and a 15 minute sermon and, and communion is not ideal um, for, uh, for everybody. And so to me, that speaks of the opportunities that are nestled in uh, what is, a, a, you know, can be a very challenging situation. Um, and I appreciate you bringing it up. It is, it's something to, to certainly be aware of. Thank you. Uh, Minnie, I think that uh, we have reached what in New York is 420 and probably is 220 um, mountain time. So I think this is the point when we will go into um, a uh, round with the panelists. Uh, a tricky, difficult question that is, I'm just asking you briefly um, 
to identify what for you today has been the, the, the key takeaways um, being part of this conversation, what you've listened to, what thoughts you've had. If your audience were only to remember or to share one takeaway from today's discussion, what would it be? And perhaps you should just, if that's okay, uh, in, in the order of our presentation, start with Tessa, if that's okay to put you on the spot. Okay. Um, I have been dealing with the subject for so many years, as, but only from medicine, from the medical aspect. And what I have learned and what I think I take away um, is, it's, it, it, I've said it, I think, but I think this is the most important uh, story is of, of human beings, of us. Um, how easily we can be um, persuaded or con be persuaded or, or convinced or, or we can convince ourselves uh, um, to do something when we know that it's totally wrong. Uh, whether it be an institution, a profession, a person, a, a private person. We've heard about journalism and the press and how they sold their souls to the devil and the uh, certainly the church did in many ways. Um, people, it just so many, um, and, we, and we're talking about professionals, so what about the people who were not professionals, not with a formal education, the people, the neighbours, the people who were living in the roads, um, just about humanity, how how scary it is that we can really become something that we know we shouldn't, but we can, we do. And um, it's been very, it's fascinated for, fascinating for me to hear what I have been thinking about for the last uh, 20 years or so, come, the same messages come out from the other professions. I think that's just an amazing, um, um, sense that I get is that there were unique things, of course, to each profession, but just as human beings, one to another, um, each, each, what we've been hearing from each profession is how, how much things changed and so quickly, how easy it was relatively to change things. Um, and then, of course, change them back afterwards. The lawyers went back to the profession, the judges went back to the profession, the doctors went back to the profession. Um, I would imagine the journalists did too. And it was as, as if situation like uh, Lifton called it in another context, but it was as if nothing had happened. And it took decades for us to learn, which is another common denominator among us, that it took so long to learn. And today when we don't have any more first-hand witnesses basically to tell us what happened. We need to more organizations like FASP and others to continue and, and, and to learn from this. Thank you. Mark, are you muted? Yeah, sorry, a little bit from today's conversation, but also more generally and taking off what Tessa said. Um, I think it's important, what I take away is how fragile um, all of these institutions and norms are in FASB. I know we talk a lot about the normalization of things that were unthinkable. Um, as you just said, these changes in Germany happened amazingly quickly. Uh, and, and I wanna pick up on something else when you said you know, everything changed. I think for students today, for young people, I don't think they recognize how much of life in Germany carried on as normal. Um, people were living in their neighborhoods. They were going to school. Oh, the Jewish shop down the street suddenly disappeared. And that family, well, they went east somewhere. And the German flag was replaced with a swastika flag. And there were more people in uniform. But the daily life, the, the cinemas, the cafes, the restaurants, the trams, all of that continued to operate. Um, but the society fundamentally changed in a heartbeat. And, and I think we must always remember that it is that collection of 
big decisions and small individual decisions that can turn a society very quickly and in some ways imperceptibly. Um, and, and even a, a society like the United States of America, which I think most of its inhabitants consider it a strong, stable, you know, well-entrenched uh, democratic system, um, these influences can can happen and happen quickly. And that, that's my takeaway. Thank you. Don? Well, uh, first of all, I would like to, to say thank you uh, to, to Matt uh, for inviting me to be part of this panel. Uh, a couple of things that I think about. One is that I feel like I'm not alone. Um, in the legal uh, law school community, I think about 200 law schools in America, I think only six of the 200 teach a course similar to the course that I'm teaching at the University of Denver. And it is reassuring and inspiring to hear what other people are doing because it gives me ideas. And uh, just as an example, Dr. Wenia is going to speak to my class in about three weeks time. Um, the other thing th that I think about is that many of us have had very privileged uh, lives. I have. Uh, my grandfather was the judge. My father was the judge. Um, I don't know what it is would be like to be classified as the other in some manner. And it makes me think about the special responsibility. And I think that's mentioned is that there are small things that we can do individually each day with people we talk to, uh, to, to try to um, encourage them, to support them. Because I definitely think that one doesn't get to where we are uh, without the help of a lot of people who have supported us, who have not treated us as if we were the other. So I think in a legal context, uh, one of my keys uh, takeaways is to remind my students again and again and again, how important they are as role models in their professional lives, but also in their personal lives, the kinds of activities they're involved in. Because whether they wanna believe this or not, people do look up to them. They look up to all of us, all of our uh, professions. And I think because of that, we have a special responsibility. And may I say just for myself, I as a white man in this society have a special responsibility to all those who haven't had all the privileges that I've had that I never earned. I just inherited them because I had the right parents. Um, so it, it's inspiring to be part of a group like this. Uh, I think this should be a normal uh, event every year. And we try to get business schools, journalism schools, medical schools, law schools to get students to, to watch what's going on here. Because it's one thing for them to hear from me. It's another thing to hear from this collective collection of voices. So thank you again. Thank you, Don. And finally, Matt Stone. Just briefly, as I look at the clock, I think what I'm really struck by today uh, in hearing from you all is the reality that all of us are, uh, we don't operate in a vacuum. Uh, we find ourselves shaped by a stream that goes back to Plato and goes back to <laughs> scripture and theology and all of these different things. And, um, and the invitation for us is in the little and big decisions that we make every day, we get to be part of shaping how the stream flows moving forward. And that's the hope. Um, what, a, what a gift to be with you all today. Thank you. So I will in a few seconds give the imaginary microphone back to Matt Vinya, but I'll just say a big thank you from my side uh, for this um, amazing panel and your contributions and your thoughtful comments and discussions. And also a big thank you to Matt Vinya and his team for inviting 
asked FASB to be part of this. This has been a great privilege and an honor to, to do this with you. The thought that I want to um, close with is um, that Medvinya, your presentation at the beginning really reminded me again of how um, luring and tempting it must have been to move from the lowlands of prescription medicine to becoming the high priests of public health. Uh, and that that in many ways is a paradigm for all the professions um, that and for that matter for many other Germans and Europeans that it was possible to become complicit in horrible crimes and see yourself as morally intact for many many uh, individuals so that there was a, a social collective dimension uh, of this of this uh, shift so I hope that we also all walk away from this session today to think about what are the strategies to encourage self-reflection, self-awareness among younger generations of professionals. But again, thank you so much for this um, and for the collaboration. Well, thank you, Torsten, and we'll wrap it up now. I just want to remind everyone that this is part of a larger program of uh, events like this around commemorating this legacy of health professional involvement in the Holocaust and the ways in which that legacy continues to affect the ways we think and act and, and be in uh, as health professionals today. We'll have another uh, program coming up in just a couple weeks, and then we have a set of programs around uh, the week of remembrance of the victims of the Holocaust in April. So just log on to our website and please, we hope to see you all there. Thank you. <laughs>